ask you uh, what the goal of this was. You said that it was to bring down a drug kingpin in Mexico. Is that a fair assessment? Did I say that, sir? Uh, I'm sorry. I guess that was Mr. Newell. Did you say that, Mr. Newell? I, I believe what I said was the goal of the investigation was to disrupt and dismantle an entire uh, firearms trafficking network. Yes, sir. And so and I believe you said a drug kingpin. Let me ask uh, Mr. Gill, do, and, and to identify some drug kingpins, let me ask Mr. Gill, does the Mexican government know who the drug kingpins are in Mexico? Sir, uh, they are aware of the heads of the, of the organizations. Uh, as, and to answer your question shortly, yes. Um, and so let me go ahead and ask you another question there, Mr. Gill. Would, in your time working with the Mexican government as a former ATF attache in Mexico, did they ever ask us to do anything like that? You know, you let guns come across the border so uh, they could track them or uh, find or bring down government king, uh, drug kingpins? No, sir. All right. Let me go on uh, to, uh, to Mr. Uh, Canino. I, I want to applaud your service and your candor with this committee. Uh, we have heard that you know, we are trying to bring down the drug kingpins or whatever the words were as far as uh, stop the trafficking. If you were put in charge of developing an investigation to do that, uh, how would you do that? Would your plan involve uh, letting firearms move across the border? Or how, how would you do it? To stop a drug kingpin? Or, or to stop the, or if you want to even go more uh, well, simply with the firearms, stop the firearms trafficking? Well, to stop a drug king, kingpin, I call DEA, because that's what they do, <laughs> number one. Number two, it's a, you work the traffic investigations paint by, paint by the numbers. The, it's frustrating to be an ATF agent. That's, that comes with the badge, okay? Um, these trafficking investigations, the laws, like I said, you have to be open-minded, I guess is the word I'm looking for. I don't know if that's the best description. But like I said, it's paint by the numbers. You have to work. It's like building a house. You start building a foundation, you work from the bottom up. In this case, nobody got stopped. They didn't grab somebody right, and, so, and say, OK, hey, we're going to roll you. I mean, there's, I don't, and I don't want to go into sources and methods, but there's a whole you know, we, we have schools on this. Yeah, that, if you watch a cop show, you know how it's done. Right. You, you, you follow the guns or you, inv or you arrest them at the first stop and try to flip them both. Or if you really want to work and partner with the Mexican government, you follow the guns till it crosses the border and radio across to your colleagues in Mexico and they move it up the line there. It seems like common sense to me. Let me ask, I, I want to ask this question to everybody on the panel because I think this is really important. We have seen Operation Fast and Furious. We have recently heard about Operation Castaway, a similar uh, program in Florida. Are, there, are any of you all aware at this time of any similar operations going on that allow guns to flow across the border to friendly countries now? Are you all aware of those? And if you are, are we doing anything to stop them? And if you could just uh, come on down the line, we will start with Mr. McMahon. I am not aware of any case like that, a friendly or unfriendly government, no. Neither am I, sir. Any, is, is anybody? Uh, no. No, sir. I am not aware no, of any. No, sir. And we only found out about this one through whistleblowers. And my prayer is that if there is anybody watching uh, this committee hearing, that's ATF or another agency, that knows of something going on like this, that they let this committee go about it. This is one of the most shameful moments, I think, in our government's history when we are letting uh, guns go across the border to our, our friends in Mexico. Let me just ask another question. I only have 32 seconds left. I'm going to stick around for a second round of questioning, so I'll yield back my remaining 30 seconds. Oh, to the and I'll pick it up. Uh, Special Agent Newell, what did this program expend in money? Millions of dollars, right? The, the program or the, the well, it, network? Fast and Furious. We, we, up on this side, we think of it as a program. You think of it as a simple investigation. The investigation, you spent millions of dollars over the course of two years, correct? I don't believe it was millions of dollars, sir. Hundreds of thousands? Probably a couple hundred thousand dollars, yes, sir. Agents were camped out in some cases for a period of time at a drop location? Yes, sir. So when you were trying to do the big hit, the big fix, the big get the roll, big guys, why is it that testimony shows us that only three times were there any 
uh, kind of detection plants, and I don't want to get into sources and methods either, but only three times we've been told that they try to do any detection, and one of these GPS tracking was a, was a Radio Shack make it yourself. Why in the world, with the quality and, this, and the quantity of agents and time, video cameras planted with Internet connections, et cetera, why is it there wasn't some tracking to track the weapons? We had trackers on, on vehicles, sir. We had tra and the, the trackers you mentioned on weapons. But again, it goes to resources. I mean, it's, it's a resources. We have agents that are out there working 16, 18, 20-hour days, and we— uh, uh, Unfortunately, you just made my case, and time has expired. 18 hours of, a, of an agent's time is so much more money than one of these tracking devices that you were penny wise and pound foolish by not having sophisticated devices. With that, we go to the gentlelady from the District of Columbia for her five minutes. Ms. Norton. Well, suppose you had had a trafficking, trafficking device. Then what would have been the next step? Well, ma'am, it depends on the, how long the firearms stayed in the area. For instance, many of, in many of the transactions here, the firearms uh, never left the Phoenix area. And trackers, the battery life of a tracker is only good you know, depending on so if it didn't leave the, the, the Phoenix area, what could you charge uh, this so-called trafficker, this law-abiding citizen there? He doesn't have a record, but he's buying uh, many, many guns. What could you charge him with? Well, there's nothing to charge him with at that point. We have to prove a violation has existed, has occurred. You know, I, I just want to say, um, it, uh, to, 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 to sit in a hearing and hear people beat up on the ATF is very, very interesting to me. You sit in a Congress where the gun lobby controls the Congress of the United States. On the Republican side of the aisle, they totally control it. On my side of the aisle, they virtually control it. And the Second Amendment is cited as, as you try to do your job to keep guns from essentially bringing down the government of an ally. Now, when it comes to Mexico, let me ask you, what kind of gun control laws does Mexico have? Any of you know about their gun control laws? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am, I do. Yes, sir, would you speak up? Um, <clears throat> civilians could buy um, nothing greater than a 38 caliber. Anything after that is for the exclusive use of uh, the military and the police. So here is Mexico, who does its job on its side of the border. It says, you, uh, essentially, it, it makes it very difficult for anyone except someone in law enforcement or the military to get a gun. So they come to the United States, where trafficking is, is, is wide open. And let me ask you this. We are concentrating on Mexico now. Let me ask you about trafficking to Chicago. Let me ask you about traveling to the District of Columbia, to Baltimore. Let me ask you about trafficking to L.A. Do these same traffickers operate as effectively in our country as we have now seen them operate, taking guns to Mexico? I believe, I believe that the, the organizations are a little bit different. That is why I said earlier about we have never encountered an organization like this in Mex for Mexico. The, the trafficking in the U.S., my experience anyway, is a little bit different. Uh, it is a little bit more uh, association related, but uh, obviously trafficking domestically is a major issue for us, and I spent the majority of my career working those kind of cases. If um, uh, a person, let us say, buys uh, 200 guns, and here you made mistakes, if I had a dollar for every mistake this Congress has made when it came to guns, I'd be a very rich woman. You made a mistake. It was a fatal, fatal mistake. It was a mistake for which you are being held accountable. Let's say you hadn't made a mistake, that someone without a record bought guns. That's me. You found me with 200 guns. What could you do to me? Uh, nothing at all, ma'am. Would uh, did you feel disarmed in your fight against this wholesale movement of guns from our country to Mexico, or did you feel you were equipped to, in fact, uh, by law enforcement to do what was necessary? 
I, I think my experience is ATF agents are very resilient. You have to be to make the case. Um, and that is what our people do, and they, they do that every day, and they are out there doing that today. And they may design tactics to try to make them to, to make themselves more effective on the ground. I think that is what we should always be doing, yes. Um, would, could I ask each of you, uh, would you feel better able to stop this traffic if the Congress passed a law uh, that made it and, and, and added to our criminal code a, a section that prohibited the transfer of a gun when an individual knows the gun will be transferred to a person who is prohibited from carrying a gun or intends to actually use the gun illegally? Uh, we currently do have a, a statute that, that does handle that. That is the whole lying on the Federal form violation. So, but lying on the Federal form gets you to where? Gets us to, if we can know, prove that someone knowingly filled out that form incorrectly or lied. Can you seize guns? We have been talking about seizures here. In order to seize guns, what does the ATF have to show? That a violation of law is committed with that firearm. Well, I'm back the, to the gentlelady's time has expired. But if anyone else wants to answer the question on what's no, yeah, I'm back to what, to what, what what's the law that's been violated. If anyone else wants to answer, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have to pr uh, prove beyond a reasonable doubt that that firearm was in some way used in violation of a of, uh, furtherance of violation of a crime or in violation of a crime. We can't just go out and randomly seize firearms from individuals. Firearms are in themselves not contraband. If we stop someone on the street with 5 AKs, 10 AKs, 20 AKs. Or 100 AKs. Or 100, and they are not prohibited. As frustrating as that may be, and, and believe me, it is extremely frustrating, but as frustrating as that may be, we may not have any legal ability to take those, to seize those firearms. Okay. Anyone else want to answer on that? Mr. Gill. Yes, Mr. Chairman. In my experience, and as I look around the room here, I have had the opportunity to work in pretty much every, you know, pretty much every state of the, of the Union. And, uh, I have always been able to use the current laws to, to success in, in the investigations. Whether you are pulling somebody over with 100 AK-47s, I found that ATF uh, special agents are very qualified in interviewing techniques. 99.9 percent .9 of the time, we will get confessions from those individuals. We will take those guns. And if not that case, then we would at least end up getting a, uh, an abandonment from them for those weapons so they don't hit the streets. So there are other avenues to approach versus uh, uh, that we could use under the current laws. Thank you. We now go to the most qualified person on the committee to ask questions, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Meehan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Special Agent Keenan. You are a trained special agent for ATF. Are you trained in the issue of walking guns? No, sir. Is there any, res with regard to walking guns, when you are in training, what do you know about, what does ATF tell you about walking guns? You don't, you don't want guns. Sir, I teach at the ATF National Academy. I teach at our first, uh, first line supervisor school. I teach at our command and control school for uh, GS 15s and above. Are you, you aware of anybody who has been disciplined for walking a gun at ATF? No, sir, but I can, Darren was talking to me last night and he put it in perspective. If you are an ATF agent and you lose your gun, it is three days, no questions asked, up to termination on the circumstance. So if you lose your gun, but you lose your gun, it is three days. Gun. Right. What do you define as walking a gun? What exactly happened in this case? Tell you me, have in to, your words, what do you think walking a gun is? Walking a gun is when you have custody and control of that firearm and you let it get in the hands of